So, so, so. Project. My name is David Crossley. I'm president of Houston Tomorrow, which a lot of you, the last time we met, probably knew as the Gulf Coast Institute. Um, and we've been having these meetings here since uh, November of 1999, as I recall. And, um, and this is a kind of an unusual one, a really good, I think, uh, opportunity to bring three professions together that are the professions that basically do uh, all the change, the development, and so forth that we see in our lives. Um, so I want to thank, this is, uh, this is National, um, this is National Planning Month. So how this all got started is with APA talking about what we can do for it. And so uh, this meeting is uh, co-sponsored by Houston Tomorrow, the uh, Houston chapter of the American Planning Association, and the Houston chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Uh, and we're grateful to the Houston Council on Engineering Companies for helping us put this together, get a speaker here. And, uh, <coughs> uh, so let's see, who is here? Brian, I know we're Nita Green from APA. Brian Moore. So what we did was ask each of these groups to choose a person, a planner, an engineer, an architect. And so these are the people from their professions or their professional associations have chosen. Uh, just immediately to my right is Jeffrey Powers, with, uh, Jeffrey Brown, with Powers Brown. Uh, and uh, next to him is Jeff Tangle, who is with HJC, with the Community and Environmental Planning. And then Stephen Costello with Costello Inc., who is an engineer, I mean, yeah, engineer, planner, architect. <laughs> um, by the way, somebody asked about there are some hats and t shirts and stuff over there. And yes, please take these. Um, there's our promotional stuff for our new name. Um, so, so the point of this is to. Well, we would just wonder, a lot of us who are not one of these professionals, who does what in the great scheme of things? And why do you decide we're going to hire this person or this kind of company to do this sort of thing? And then to talk about what exactly, you know, in a big process of some giant public thing, maybe a whole master planning community or something like that, you know, who goes first? And who who, you know, how, who, what works, what the workflow is, what the responsibilities are, and what the philosophies of the different professions are. Um, you know, doctors do no harm, and I'm sure everybody has something that, they, that, that they're supposed to, or a set of principles or something they're supposed to adhere to. And, um, and at this, particularly right now, this really incredible, you know, economic and political moment in America when it's so clear that no matter what happens next Tuesday, massive amounts of change is already cooking up, mostly economically. But, but earlier in the year, we've almost forgotten what happened with gas prices, and now all of a sudden we notice vehicle miles traveled going down, huge amounts of change in the way people look at the suburbs and driving every day. And that continues, uh, and it was, it, was, it was such a big reaction to that that we've actually driven the price of oil down because demand has decreased significantly over the past several months. Will that keep going? What's the world going to look like as we rethink it? And so, more specifically, what's Houston going to look like, the whole region, as we rethink it in all, in all of this change? So, this notion of sustainability, or a sustainable Houston, is a, sort of ultimately we're going to ask how these professionals and take us there. What needs to be done? What do we need to think about? What needs to change? And, and all that. So um, this is the kind of, I call it the intellectual uh, firepower to sort of get change to happen in a concrete way. So, uh, so here, I'll start with a question. I'm going to ask them to each uh, talk for a few minutes of, uh, to about the general concept of what they do. And then I'm going to ask a series of questions, and then not long into this, I'll ask you to start commenting or asking questions or engaging in some dialogue. So be thinking about that as you go. So let's start with this, this first general question, which is um, asking you to give us an overview of the sort of how your professions work, what the philosophies are, the 
practices and so forth. And, uh, and then tell us how the system works. I mean, it, it, this idea of who goes first in a project. And I know sometimes um, the, the client doesn't get that there's a difference and just hires somebody. It's, it's this could have been whether well, they got the right person or not. Um, but how does that all work? You know, and how, how in a really big project, and, and I want to say some, we can talk about private projects like master plan communities or or whatever, or, and, and but really we like to spend some energy on public infrastructure and all of that, the buildings, the roads, the sewers, the whole thing, and how we get to that infrastructure, the natural space. Um, so, so I guess that's it. What, what could, could we get four or five minutes from each of you about that? And, uh, Jeffrey, why don't you just start? Sure. Well, thank you. Uh, and, and of course, I'm very glad to be invited to visit with you guys. So I'm the architect, uh, I guess, on the panel, but I'm also a trained as an urban designer. And uh, that's a big debate within our profession. And that is, uh, when does it stop being architecture and when does it start being urban design? Is it, uh, you know, is urban design somehow a collection of buildings and architecture is only one building, so on and so forth. So that's one of the bigger uh, issues that, that we face, and in particular practicing in Houston, it's a kind of interesting thing to talk about, right? You see a lot of clusters of buildings together that don't look planned or urban design, I would say. Uh, and, uh, and we think a lot about that. Our, our, you know, the question, as David's got a phrase here, is, uh, you know, an overview of the philosophies and practices that, that guide our profession. I, mean, I think everybody, are there any architects in the room? No? I have an architecture degree, but I don't. Close enough, right? <laughs> uh, so just maybe one and a half of us. Um, well, we do, we do buildings, and, and uh, David just whispered to me, that's amazing, I'll say it out loud, it is amazing to me, because what happens in my profession is that we uh, have a philosophy that uh, conflicts with our actions. That's, that's the dilemma of what I do for living. Architects are, uh, consider ourselves to really be the, the stewards of the common good, the equation of the physical environment. And I'm also a professor at U of H, so I say things sometimes that sound like that, but <laughs> I don't mean it to sound it to complicated. You see, we are the only people typically we convince ourselves that don't have a vested interest in anything. So if we're working with the client, the client's working with the bank, and, uh, uh, and the client also has to get approval from Trees for Houston, or has to deal with the local code official, and so on. All of those people have a vested interest. The bank wants to make a profit, the Trees people want to get trees, the historical guys don't want to have any arches knocked down, and so on. Uh, and in the middle of all that is, is the architect. And we think of ourselves as a steward of the common good. And so you can see why it would make sense for us to intersect with uh, urban design, as distinguished from planning, maybe you have to define those things for us. But uh, we think of ourselves that way. And then you have a meeting about sustainable communities in an accessible place in the middle of town, and no architects show up. So we're stewards of the common good in some way, and uh, at least took the terms of our philosophy, and uh, not very good practitioners of, uh, of stewardship. Um, so that's, uh, I mean, I don't know that you're asking for more overarching things and not so much about our work. And regarding sustainability, we are really handcuffed and encumbered by the USGBC and LEED which is uh, a system for rating the greenness of something, which may or may not have anything to do with the same sustainability of something. and certainly does not operate in any way at the scale of communities. We can talk about that more depth. That's four minutes right there. <laughs> well, uh, I see some other planners in the room, and it's a little daunting <laughs> to be representing the profession with uh, just colleagues out there nodding uh, but I think most of you would share uh, my difficulty in, in 26 years in this business coming up with that elevator definition of what we do. Uh, he designs buildings, he designs infrastructure, obviously oversimplified. Those of us in the planning business uh, sometimes are hesitant to say, we plan cities. Uh, that, that gets done by a lot of people in, in kind of a, a messy way. Uh, so I think in our profession, sometimes there's been a tendency to latch on to other things that sound somehow more tangible and descriptive. And uh, during my career, planners have been the zoning experts. Uh, and then we were the GIS, the GIS experts, or, or the subdivision experts, or uh, more recently, the facilitation experts, the visioning experts. Uh, 
I'm going to go back to, even if it overstates what we actually contribute, that, that we plan cities. Our profession as such, don't need to step on any toes, uh, there, there is almost nothing in it that is our unique province. Uh, our, our basic philosophy is, is built on geography and sociology, uh, history, design. Uh, we intersect quite a bit with uh, civil engineering, law, I would argue business, occasionally political science. Uh, but we're the only profession uh, whose sphere really encompasses all of those things at the same time. And uh, well, early in the career, not having that elevator explanation, that was very frustrating for me as I've, as I've aged. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm more and more proud of the fact that we're not particularly specialized. Uh, and, and as far as we're a client is, uh, most of us work for uh, city government, so clients, the city council, uh, regional government, board directors, a consulting for the public sector, maybe we work for a developer. Uh, but our client really is the community. And I don't just mean the residents who are coming for that public hearing on that controversial project. If we're doing our job correctly, we give the elected officials who make decisions to spend money and pass laws, I think a, a compelling vision and a good template within which those decisions are made. Uh, that template is informed uh, by our ability to, to uh, facilitate uh, citizen desires, kind of uh, mesh with realities and uh, impacts on the business and economy. Uh, that, that sounds a little bit vague. Uh, I do so deliberately because there is really no one size fits all. Uh, I think the idea of, uh, although there are some in our profession feel like, well, there is a, a right way to plan a city and we all ought to be doing work in uh, communities. Uh, I, I think our job is really to, to see what is, is possible and uh, hopefully elevate the sights of those around us. Uh, as far as what we can do to, to uh, make things more sustainable, uh, I would argue that you know, 26 years ago when I started that the fundamentals of sound comprehensive planning pretty much are the fundamentals of sustainability. Uh, more or less, uh, having a good balance of community, economy, and environment uh, in, in a way that's fiscally responsible and uh, politically doable, uh, to me, sounds like something that can be sustained. We can get into more specifics of that definition uh, later in the discussion. Wow, that was a lot. <laughs> How many of y'all are engineers here? There's a couple of us. Um, we're actually what we call, or what I call, I don't mean it to be my profession, the bottom few. Uh, we're actually, relative to a community, we're the foundation of the community. <coughs> Bless you. Uh, we're responsible for the infrastructure to service a particular community, whether it's water, sewer, paving, drainage, highways. Uh, I, remember that, I remember when I first graduated college, I got a call from my mom, and she says to me, Steve, can you come over and fix my toast? <laughs> I'm an engineer, I can't do that. Oh, I thought engineers fixed everything. You know, and and it's, it, it's a nice conception to have, or a misconception to have, but uh, what we do, if, if you look at the ethics description of our professions, is that we design facilities for the health, safety, and welfare of the general public. And so everyone that sits here is theoretically my client, even though you're not paying me, someone else is paying me. Uh, and where, how we interface with the other two professions is it, it kind of depends on what we're trying to do at, at that particular moment in time. Uh, I'm a civil engineer. My specialty is, is flood specialty, so I, I've had a very good living here down in Houston over these years. Uh, but uh, there are a number of other engineering professions that, uh, and disciplines that function within what we have just described to you prior to me. Uh, structural engineers, mechanical electrical uh, I'm basically a civil engineer in flooding, and then there are a number of engineers that do water and wastewater design. So uh, there, there are a lot of disciplines within the overall umbrella of engineering. However, uh, you know, it's funny, as I drive through a community, uh, or as I start working on a massive plant community, which is one of our core businesses, uh, I, I always wonder, I say to myself, wow, this is who thought of this? 
and, and, I, and I have to say, to be honest with you, that I think the engineers are the other side of that brain. Uh, we're not really the, the, the major thinkers or the artistic element, but we're what we call the doers. We'll get it done. Uh, and what happens is, is when the artistic element comes up with an idea, they come to the engineer and they ask, can we do this? And that's basically what our role is. Yes, we're your foundation. Yes, you can do that. Uh, how many of y'all have driven through a parking garage and wonder, how did he, how did that person realize I can get my truck or my car through this parking garage? Uh, so it's, it's really truly amazing what an architect does in a building. But to me, a parking garage is, is probably the most difficult than just a building. Uh, so it's really amazing how they can visualize it. Uh, whereas an engineer, uh, we function from the surface down. Uh, a lot of our work you don't even see. Unless you turn on the faucet, you don't get any water. Or unless you flush the toilet and it comes back in the wrong direction. Uh, and then, you, then you realize why, what role we have in, in your community and life in general. Uh, I'm not going to talk about sustainability. I want the conversation to flow into sustainability because there's a lot to talk about sustainability and how our profession can with that. David? Great, thanks. And, and I'm going to, uh, I almost want to interrupt the flow and do this sustainable versus green thing, but, but we'll get to that. So I want, to, I want to think about this notion, which I'm sure is just my own fantasy, but this notion of an ideal system of how these stuff work. And I all of a sudden thought about you know, maybe the woodlands would be sort of my example, how that happened, where the person was a visionary one to do something really good. And then there was this Ian McCarg person who was brought in to say, the natural background is this. And we have to totally understand all of that before we start putting buildings on it, roads on it, or sewers, or anything. And so he was the planner. And then I would guess, and I don't know how this actually works, I'm sure fine, that then architects and engineers were brought in to figure out how to, how to construct places people can live and work, and how to make it all work. And so so that, uh, but the, the planner came first, and that's in my mind. It seems like that's the ideal, and I would say an example of where we absolutely don't see that is uh, in highways. No planners are ever involved in Texas, thinking about highways. And, and I view, and Jeff, you maybe I'll ask you to go first here, then um, I, I, I suspect a lot of what planners do that is quite different is the interface with the citizens and their values. What's trying to be done for them? Well, what are we, you know, okay, it isn't just build a highway, it's to do what? And, and so that isn't that the realm of the planner, and it's this ideal system where you know, the planner goes first, possibly gets out of the way, the architects and engineers that do it. Is, is that appropriate? You know, I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, first of all, it's a broad question because, uh, you know, I was taught uh, by Colin Rowe, who was one of the great educators in urbanism. In fact, uh, Fred Coder is who I, you know, studied under and taught with at Harvard. It was his project. And Colin used to talk about this, uh, the dilemma of Austin, he called it. He was fascinated by, he was in Austin as one of the Texas Rangers in 56 or so before he was run off and changing the educational system at UT. And he got fascinated with Austin, Texas. And he presents a problem something like this. He said, along come these people on the frontier. And uh, I'm going to step on planners a little bit because uh, as an urban designer, we have you know, different thoughts about that. And there's an ideal utopian process. They had a place they wanted to put the city. They had a form uh, that was the grid with the holes in it. And they plopped it on the ground. Uh, topography be damned. And uh, then they filled it in with the city. And over time, the ideal diagram becomes infected with circumstantial you know, things, for example, economies, uh, uh, whatever happens over time, and they fill it in. He said, now imagine Austin, now Colin's writing this in the mid-70s, uh, being uh, done today, right? A, a great city that's gonna be a capital of a great state or nation state uh, is proposed, and you would have to assemble, and he gets into this language, descending language, actually, that says you'd assemble planners and demographers and geographers and sociodemographics people, and economics people and politicians, and they would generate data and data and data and information and data and, and process these data and 
build this kind of big social program, set of expectations, and so on, but you'd never have Austin. And in fact, you know, he's able to prove over and over you never end up in a city, right? And when you think about the process that we go through now to generate this thing called the program, which is really, uh, David, I'm trying to use a story to illustrate your condition of that the planner envisions what it wants to be. I, I think that's kind of what you said, right? Ian comes in in the woodlands and he looks at the lay of the landscape, but he also looks at the the socioeconomic and socio-demographic conditions and so on, and this broader range of education that you guys receive that deals with these things or intersects these disciplines, it has to predict a strategy uh, for what it wants to be, what's appropriate, if that makes sense. And then somehow uh, along behind one of these functionaries, architects got to decorate it right so it, you know people want to function in the environment and you got to get an engineer to put the infrastructure in place. So I don't know if there's an idea. The funny thing is nothing ever happens ideally. Something in between that notion of Austin just as a form, and what nowadays this notion of perpetual programming, right? That we never we never can quite decide on what the form's going to be because there's too much data uh, to tell us at any moment to be something else. Uh, there's almost this imperfect condition where I think there's a lot more collaboration and analogical work overlapping, there's things going on simultaneously, right? The community being envisioned and strategized at the same time that the market is trying to predict ahead of time and hedge itself what buildings are going to go there. So over, I think that it's a more overlapped and nuanced condition than it is a linear, as it were, condition. And I think that's the, I don't know about ideal, but it's the more realistic condition that happens. And that's the problem that we have is that there's a plan, right? And I don't know how often I've been told that the master plan doesn't matter anymore. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to a meeting at 3 o'clock today in Bryan College Station uh, to deal with that that we did a building in accordance with the master plan, they said, well, that, hell, that was done in 2000. That's, we're over that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I were bringing that story up, and I am unfortunately not. Uh, and so the, the planning is going up. And then this other kind of, you know, I'm working with, say, a developer uh, uh, to do something, and, I, I'm, and, and, and they're happening independently almost. And I think some of that did actually happen. I've talked too long, but a complicated answer to your question a complicated question. Well, uh, I'll perhaps oversimplify. Uh, I would compare it to uh, coaching a football game. I don't, I don't think there are too many coaches that just go in with the kickoff and figure they'll decide what play to call uh, the, the first possession or the huddle. Uh, <laughs> what, when they see what the other team is lining Not a Texas fan, then. <laughs> not, not too much. I've, I've seen a lot of that. <laughs> coach with uh, the first dozen plays or so written out, and I think that's uh, kind of what you're talking about. Uh, I do think at the beginning, even of a, a private development project, there's, there's a sociological aspect as a market analysis, phase. so I don't think you can just, just take that off the table. Uh, I think there's, there's finite engineering principles that go in at the beginning of every project, regardless of goals and values. The bridge has to hold. So uh, I guess I'm saying that, that those things, uh, you, you don't just uh, begin a vision that could lead you away from any practical results. Uh, but I don't think you just start out and say we're going to react at every phase. Uh, now the coach who says, okay, I've called all 56 plays for the game, uh, probably is, is not going to be real successful either. I, I think a good process is one where we have some general consensus on big picture goals that are, are defined in such a way that they help us uh, with infrastructure, with economic, and, and with uh, political and regulatory decisions. And then we make good judgments uh, on individual projects. I, I've never seen a, a master plan community uh, that doesn't have a little bit of a Disney-esque aspect. I think the accidents of time and the market and changing pace uh, are, are what makes cities great. But I also don't think that you can say that, that the market has just randomly successfully produced great places. Uh, what, what are the most beloved places in Houston? I'd submit to you that most of them are in the Arthur Comey 1927 plant. Uh, you know, the market didn't lay out the parkways and the Main Street Esplanade and, and those sorts of things. So uh, I, I agree that, that those things uh, probably are occurring more in parallel than in linear process. But I, I think that socioeconomic uh, or sociological hopes and dreams part needs to be up pretty close to the front. Well, I'll address the mass planning aspect of a, of a residential development, like a Woodlands. Uh, when we get involved in the initial phases of the planning activity, uh, 
where the, the client has a vision and he sits down with the planner and says, oh, I have this vision of this community and, and I want it to have some type of residential component, I want it to have some type of commercial component, I want it to have some type of, of recreational component too. Uh, with the planner, we get involved and, and as Jeff said, what happened, you know, if you took Austin out and sort of lower, we're the ones that are understanding the topo of the land. We're the ones that are understanding the available utilities to an area prior to a development occurring. So we will work in conjunction with the planner to set out how we can service that development should it develop into that vision that the planner, the planner and, and the owner has. Uh, however, as, as, as Jeff just said, uh, it is a, uh, a moving target. It, it's a master plan for one day and then it changes. Uh, however, what you have to do initially when you first start a project is not make the mistake on the first day. And so if you visualize yourself like your skeleton, we'll design the major facility, which would be maybe the major roads going through it. Uh, we call it the major thoroughfare. So just like the, your arms, your legs, and your backbone. Then everything else is subject to change. And what changes or what forces change is market conditions what the market is looking to develop out there. Uh, every day is a new day in, in the residential construction, every day is a new day in commercial and real estate in general. So the plan has to be flexible enough to accommodate for that. Uh, on the engineering side, we have to take some pretty global assumptions in terms of utilization of those facilities to make sure that we design them one time and we build them one time. And then as we develop out, we develop into it. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a very fluid system of interaction between all professions rather than in a linear one-time of it. It's very fluid. Well, it's very interesting. The, the sort of values and goals part, which I spend more time on that. Most people, I think, so I'm really sensitive to uh, when somebody will say, well, we want it to be a place to be walkable. Well, you know, elected officials will say, well, that's just vague. That's not meaningful. You know, well, you shouldn't have tempted side by side, you know, whatever. And, and that's not the point. The point is, is it walkable? You may change the plan as you go through it all. Uh, but, but, but you have that value that you're supposed to be adhering to about that. And, uh, and a great example on how I should have you know, the, the, the mobility plan in the city of Houston uh, doesn't have any guiding principles or any values or goals. And then when I sat with mostly engineers on that panel and asked questions about that, right, so no. it was it was a mystifying concept. Why would you have goals? Why would you have values? Why would you have principles? We're just trying to deal with traffic. And so I would say, okay, well you could say we want the cars to go faster. That would be a value. Or we want more of them to be able to get through a given spot, a day or an hour, that would be a value different from speed. Or we want to be safe, and those are all different. Um, but nobody has stated any of this. So, so how, and, and really it's, some, it's astonishing how many processes are going on in the city that are actually totally controlled by engineers. Well, <laughs> so is that, uh, you know, how do you feel about that? Well, I, I think in the engineering profession, we're asked to solve a problem. And, and, that's, and it's, it's very, and my wife coins it as we have blinders on. And we're given a problem and we're told to solve it. Now, if you gave us a problem that had a whole number of potential solutions, that's probably what the plan is going to do. We're going to tell you a few of the plan. Uh, because that's what our role is. Our role is, is to solve the problem. So when you, when you ask an engineer as far as what the values and goals are for, uh, for your mobility plan, it's, it's not that they don't have values and goals, they just call it different. Well, my solution is I'm delivering more traffic from one location to another location in a short period of time. They don't call it a value, they don't call it a goal, they call it a solution, they solve the problem. So I, th I think it's more in terms of terminology than it is in terms of we lack vision. Uh, I, I no, let, me, let me just uh, make it a little, say I would also say 
say what the problem is. And in here, I mean, the mobility plan doesn't even say what the problem is. So, so I would say the problem is an expression of goals and values. It's a solution to what? What is the problem? Well, is everybody familiar that the city's going through the process of a, a new general mobility plan? Some of us are. And really, to me, I, I think the overall problem has been defined as the city has been coined as a traffic problem city. And so what I think we're trying to solve is that particular perception. The, the, the actuality of it is that the city does have defined goals, and they were established by the Planning Commission. There are seven guiding principles that the Planning Commission set forth for the mobility plan to operate under. Those goals are also derived from the goals of Safety Lou and, and the federal guidelines for how mobility should be increased through many modes, not just a singular mode of the automobile. And so that it, it is out there, and it is it just it, at that meeting, David, we hadn't gotten the city to agree to what they were yet. We, we've 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 moved past that stage and. We are functioning from a solve the, the problem from a perspective of balancing the goals because your goals often compete. And so you can't have all walkable places because some of them have to move cars. And, and that's that's the balance of where we're at now. But I heard the but court I, court I, court I, think, I think David's on to something if I could just abstract it a little bit, which is um, you know when you when you look at the role engineering has in a vision versus the, you know, the role that the goals or values have. And that's the hard part, is that it's not quantifiable expertise. It's not quantifiable data. If I, if I draw a building and I say, well, I'm going to have the ceiling be 11 feet tall. I'll tell you why I'm going to have, I don't know, 60 people in that room. That's a good space. And above that ceiling, there's uh, five feet of black stuff. I just draw it black. It's just stuff that somebody else works out what goes in there. And I present it to the client. And, uh, and we have a problem. And the guy at the engineering side comes back and says, well, in that black stuff, there's not enough room. My canute rod and muffler bearings won't fit, and I need to override the, you know, uh, and so on, and we need another six inches. And then it finds us, okay, and I say, well, hold up on the six inches, because see, it's gonna make the space a little flatter, and the quality of life in this room will be diminished. And, uh, and the contractor says, well, it'll cost X. And the client says, uh, make it deeper, take the six inches out, and screw the quality of life. And I think, I, I know, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make light of it, but I think this is a dilemma that we face that, that on my side of it, if I say to you, well, uh, uh, look, this is, this, the interplay between people, space, and buildings is how I define urban design, right? It's that interplay between people, space, and buildings. Now that sounds like, uh, as, as you know, my grandfather would have said, bullshit. You know, it sounds like one of these things that, what does that mean, the interplay? You know, how good do you feel in the space that two buildings create and how that happens? And that's hard to quantify. Uh, but if somebody says, I'll tell you what, if those two buildings are X number of feet apart, it's going to cost X number of dollars to put the road in. That's quantifiable. And that's where, where values are harder to sell uh, in, a, in an environment where you're creating a, a community than are the quantifiable data. That's why highways are out of control. The highway guys uh, tell you that you know in order to turn your Hummer at 40 miles an hour and not tip the groceries over and have the kids binky stay in their mouth, you've got to have a radius of 600 feet. And you say, but my God, we got to rip out this whole community plan in 1942 to do that. And they'll say, but in order not to have the Humber turnover, and they'll talk to you like you're an idiot. And you'll say, but what, you know, what about these other compositional issues? Well, what do you mean by composition? Well, it won't be as beautiful. <coughs> and there's that stunning silence we just had right there. Right? It's, it, again, those values, which gets back to where I was headed with the green versus sustainable. To me, green is the technique, sustainable is the value. And, and that's what makes it hard to, to talk about sustainable community. You can, you can do it that way. I see a lot of people don't understand. I thought I just thought of that. So if I did, or something, I said, <laughs> <laughs> let me know. I, I'd like to move you know, just a little bit on, on sustainable. Uh, I, I think we have a tendency of misunderstanding what sustainable really is and what it means. A lot of us think it's green, and it's not. Uh, there are other components relative to sustainable. Uh, I'm from the East Coast. I've been here 30 plus years. I consider used to my home. I have two sons who remind me they're Texans and I'm not. <laughs> I don't want Houston to become Detroit. And, and what happened to Detroit is a lack of sustainability. And what we have to recognize on the foundation side, the engineering side, is the lack of investment in our infrastructure. 
Right? Sustainability does not mean you build it once and it survives forever. It won't survive forever. It has to be maintained. It has to be invested. And it changes. The environment changes. Our social condition changes. Even what we do for everyday changes our, our living. And so we have to be able to build facilities that can survive but still have to be maintained. And so what I, what I contend is that what's happening here in Houston today and will continue to happen unless we put more money in our infrastructure for replacement. Uh, you can see here and down in, in within inside this, the, the loop, redevelopment requires reinvestment. And what we're doing now is not reinvesting in our facilities. Uh, if you think about low impact development, that's the green aspect of engineering. Well, what low impact development does is it mitigates only for the development. It doesn't improve what is decaying. All right? And what that is, it's due to what I call uh, ownership. Uh, you have your house, you buy your house, your house starts to deteriorate 10 or 12 years later, what do you do? Well, you put more money into the house to fix it, to make sure it stays there. Well, we're not doing that in our infrastructure. We're not doing that in, for instance, some of our historical buildings. We need the investment back into, back into these facilities to maintain them for future generations. That's the difference between green versus sustainable. Can I, see, that's what the architects get trapped into being flakes. So I'm going to be a flake for a minute. I'm going to make a formula. And I'll say, well, if you, if you keep value floating out there. Uh, and if I said to you that the, that the sense of permanence, right, that sense of placeness in a city in Europe is constituted by buildings, and in America it's constituted by infrastructure, uh, everybody probably bought that, right? And if you want to block a road off in downtown Houston the street, believe me, the poopy hits the fan. You would think that, you're, that the, the world's going to change. We don't, we don't, our infrastructure constitutes our sense of permanence here, right? Now, I don't know if you have a quality experience in your infrastructure every day. If you drive down just a beautiful freeway on the 59 coming in, and there's a beautiful, I don't know what that is, maybe shortness of commute is the quality experience? Well, Jeff, but some people think driving down I-10 right now is beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> those, who, those who are in traffic every day. Yeah, people that like afford lanes of traffic, yeah. And so all I'm saying is that there's, a, there's again, this, the value of things comes back, that, that the sense of permanence in the American city is constituted by infrastructure, in my formula, and the sense of permanence in the European city is constituted by buildings. And buildings contribute to your values in a certain way. They either represent or they don't. They contribute to your sensory experience, your phenomenological experiences in a certain way, or they don't. And infrastructure is different. Uh, I mean, it can be beautiful, and I argue that it can't be beautiful. And I'm certainly not arguing that it's not important. But I'm saying that everything you described just to be provocative is, well, we've got to take care of our infrastructure, and measure if our infrastructure deteriorates, you know, we're going to elect a different president, and the world can change. And that's all true. But does that represent our values, or does something else? Yeah. It, it is something else that's the, 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 the repository of our values, and that's where the, the community and sustainable pieces come in. How do you make that sustainable? Is it just really easy to maintain the infrastructure? I, I don't. I guess I don't. Know. You know, there was an interesting uh, tie into that European example. A comment made at the Houston Mobility Planning Meeting that uh, David was referring to. Uh, Kind of getting back to that standard for the Hummer, we were talking about the ambiance of narrow streets, and uh, well, that will never fly because we can't get fire trucks down them. And then we got into an interesting debate of, you know, are European cities burning to the ground? Because, uh, you know, they, they have narrow streets too. And, and so values, I think, there uh, with respect to buildings or the infrastructure of the narrow street have, have trumped the cost of special ordering some other kind of fire. I think the same is true, you know, with, with travel speeds or safety. Uh, I think there are some absolutes. Uh, the bridge, even if it's historic, <laughs> you don't want the bridge to fall down, and, and uh, you know everything else is maybe negotiable. Uh, I, I think you make a great point. I I, I don't think architects should have the sole province of a flake title though. So <laughs> yeah, please have some. <laughs> I, I think that uh, in in newer cities especially, uh, there's been a little bit of a transition, not, not the infrastructure is the defining value, but from the public to the private realm. And uh, I think especially in, in a uh, city like Houston, in a climate like Houston, uh, if, if you look at uh, you know, business organizations and other groups, what, what do they promote about Houston? Uh, what was the chief thing? Uh, it's, it's opportunity. 
and that's expressed in terms of, you know, it's low barriers to entry of business, uh, low housing costs. So the things that, that we put forward, you know, in our, our press clippings are all essentially things that are in the private realm. Uh, it's not grand boulevards, it's not public spaces, it's, it's not, uh, well, there's skyscrapers, but not iconic historic architecture and those sorts of things. So I think it's much more difficult uh, in, in a place that's uh, the values are focused on the private realm, not to, obviously we all need to get around it and flush the toilet, but not, not to sort of default to, well, infrastructure must be the most important thing about planning. Because I've got a, a flat screen and a nice rec room that I got, you know, at a really good price. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's go on a little bit. Just this morning, there have been several recent blogs and so forth about the idea that sustainability is not enough, that, you know, that the, the UN definition is, is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the needs of future generations. And, and, and we've been arguing with this for quite a while. It needs for human beings is just not enough. I mean, it desires the 95% of the ball game and we have to deal with it. And so when you start to put values like uh, a pretty thing that came out today about the 20 prettiest towns in America and these pictures of you can imagine they're all you know they're wonderful little harbors and you know, it's fall and the trees are all you know but that is a choice that we want to make. We want our town or our city to be beautiful or not because we've got some other values that's more important and I don't think we probably all be used to making a living and that opportunity thing has been much more important everything else in the health of the air. So how would you think sustainability can kind of open up into a value like I've these blogs I've been reading the same thing. We have to we have to do more than just sustain because we're human. So I, I uh, about three months ago I gave a uh, speech to our economic uh, development is uh, Global Chambers of Commerce and Economic Development uh, Organizations. And uh, I, I took it out of context, but I read a bunch of statistics about uh, a place that uh, was number one in the nation in job creation and had the uh, second busiest port and uh, other clippings about the great opportunity that existed in Cleveland, Ohio in 1900. And uh, I think the, the Detroit example is also cautionary. Uh, you know, economic sustainability is, is a uh, fickle thing. We've had a longer run than most, but uh, I, I would just suggest, and not to get into the green versus sustainable debate, take a look at places that have invested in historic preservation, quality of life, uh, environmental amenities, green infrastructure, and, and tell me which ones of those have failed over time. Uh, San Francisco and New York's economies have very little to do with what, what they began as, uh, but, and, and we could argue whether they're great opportunity cities, but uh, that there's certainly a tremendous amount of, of financial activity uh, because people want to be there, and, and the port and, and the cost of housing and office space uh, apparently is, is not that big a deal as far as them being sustainable economically. So, uh, I think sustainability, again, kind of goes back to place, in my view. By the way, a uh, very interesting question, uh, since none of us in this room are, are sustainable, uh, as it were. So when we talk about sustainability, are we talking about sustainability of a place or uh, of us? Yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, the beauty argument, I use instead of pretty beauty. And, you know, because when you're teaching a bunch of millennial kids, right, they got a trophy just for being on the soccer team. It doesn't even matter if you win anymore. When you're trying to deal with what's happening in education, like I have maybe 12 or 15 years as I've, as I've practiced on the other side of my life. And I listen to my colleagues, and we don't use that word beauty anymore. It's dreadfully old-fashioned to discuss uh, the aesthetics of something. You can discuss certainly uh, all kinds of cool stuff in architecture school, like did you cut it with a laser? Uh, what's its process? Uh, what does it represent regarding, you know, uh, cultural chaos and all these other kinds of things. Uh, but, the, but what it looks like is tough. And I think that's just because it's tough to decide uh, what is beautiful. 
That is to say that the new urbanists continue to succeed and fail because the argument is in their form of what I would call manufactured consent, that everything uh, obtains towards a nostalgic historical uh, kind of uh, look on a building. And Frank Liu reinforced this the other day in a meeting when he said to me, well, Jeffrey, why is it you guys always want to make this stuff look modern? It's just so damn ugly. <laughs> and, you know, the flip side of it is that the, the, uh, you know, in these magazines, uh, I assure you, this is the current issue of Architect Magazine, uh, that, by the way, goes on to prove that LEED uh, doesn't work right now. Um, so, you know, right? Uh, it's, it does have an article that says it's scientifically proven not to work so far to save energy. Who knows what that means? But there's nothing nostalgic in here. That is to say that there's a, a real bust in what we do for a living, at least certainly what I do for a living, that says, oh, look, here's the deal. Uh, you just get a vote from everybody in the room, and we'll all have a big pile out and a chin wag, and we'll decide what the right form for the community is. And then we'll all, you know, and it matters to me what you people think, even though you have no training in architecture, you never read any books about it, but I'll listen to you anyway. You can tell me how you want it to, you know, that's the attitude a lot of architects have, right? Uh, you know, you can show me pictures of your grandmother's cottages and everything, and then we'll make this place, and then you're going to be happy. It'll be beautiful or pretty or whatever. Uh, or, uh, hey, I have all this training, right? I've been studying this for a long time, and uh, we're past all that historical stuff, and, you know, form is what it is, and I'm an expert in form, you don't know anything about it. So I'll tell you what's going to be beautiful. I, you know, I, my argument or counter argument to that all the time is simply this when it comes to Houston. It's a 615, 14, or 17 square mile city, depending on who you ask. Over 600 square miles, let's just agree on that. And it's composed of a series of episodes because if anybody ever told you the River Oaks wasn't pretty or beautiful, uh, then they'd be wrong or haven't been there, right? It's, it, they were, or let's just say Westview. Now, the, the sort of you know, connective nothingness in between, you know, that and the next place as it pops out of the, you know, the canopy is, uh, it can be terrifying. Maybe a terrifying beauty, I don't know. Uh, but, but I'm not sure that, that, that you can apply wholesale to these notions of beauty on account, uh, either aesthetically uh, or at a scale that obtains to 600 square mile city. I don't know if that makes sense, but, but it's a hard, it's an important thing to talk about because it's what everybody comes back from Europe, as Frank Lou just had, and says, I was just in Spain and it looks great and I want my stuff to look like that. In which case, you go, then you should hire a Spanish architect. I, you know, I don't do that. So it's, it's a very complicated uh, argument because it does, it is the repository again of values. I'm going to stand because my voice doesn't project too well. Uh, I'm thinking about two things. One is the complexity that we're dealing with. Um, all of these parts, I think of solving the problems that we have in Houston. We, we have infrastructure problems, we have traffic problems, we have poverty. We just have a, had a hurricane that devastated Galveston and parts of the city. And how do, you, how do we come together to, in other words, how does planning deal with real problems? And the second thing that I keep thinking about is, is it just all about money? Where is the voice of our diverse community? Um, who's really deciding the shape of our, our city, our community? And, and sometimes I think it's just all about money. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the money issue, uh, and, and I'm going to be candid with you. I'm sort of a converter right now. I'm a tweener between an engineer and, and someone who is beginning to appreciate the environment. Uh, I've been associated with the Memorial Park Conservancy for 13 years, uh, and now I'm actually the chairman of, of the conservancy. And I've, I've, over the years, have, have started to realize that there is a different element to, to my profession, and so things are changing, but we don't we don't dictate that change. That change has to come from our clients, who are actually developing the projects. Uh, and yes, it is about money. However, the market dictates what people develop, and so if you don't buy what they build, they'll build something else. And so that that's where it comes from. It's actually a groundswell from the general public that dictates what these people build. And you know, the nice thing about Houston is it can do place, uh, Houston and all the surrounding communities. 
Uh, it's also a property rights place in the state of Texas. That's what's nice about the state of Texas. You know, I can do whatever I want to because by God, it's my property. <coughs> but if you're going to develop that property, and if you don't develop it to what the general public wants, then it's going to have to change. And so it, it's a slow process. And, and I think what we're having today on the engineering side is we're seeing a redevelopment within Houston that the market is dictating and it's changing as we go. Uh, that's, I mean, the challenge is to integrate quality of life features into, into parts of Houston that have really ignored them over the years. You know, I was having, a, speaking of property rights, a discussion with a property rights advocate uh, about walkable communities, David. Uh, and it's my personal belief, not a position of this organization, that uh, we ought to have sidewalks everywhere, even, even in uh, low-density suburban developments. And he said, well, how could you justify the cost to a first-time homebuyer, that extra cost of sidewalk in front of the house, if they didn't even want it? And I, I answered, well, how, how do you justify the cost of paving the street? Uh, to me, a good planning process is engaging in that dialogue and deciding where that tipping point is. And, and maybe we have that dialogue and we realize that there's only a couple people who really care about walkability and, and we like it. But we, we haven't had that sort of dialogue on a lot of these issues. Uh, instead, we've, we've had, uh, I like that term, poor consensus uh, sort of a manufacturing consensus, kind of in the other way, that we at all costs uh, need to uh, not do anything to upset the production of, of affordable housing and affordable space and any, any further discussion of, of issues that might intercede with that uh, ought to be avoided uh, for fear that it might, it might not work. Uh, well, obviously, you know, a, a, any process that we go through is, is going to have to have bond issues or private money or, or something behind it or we're just just uh, putting books up on the shelf. Just from my, my profession, i got to say, I, I can't understand how that decision is made worse, though, by going through that dialogue with the community. I, I don't know how that in any way uh, degrades our ability to make good decisions with our resources. I, I'll give you two quick answers. Uh, the first question is, how do we solve all of our problems? Uh, my my reaction to that just extemporaneously would be that, you know, most of what I see, uh, certainly from form and planning, and somewhat politically, and uh, somewhat economically, is a, an inability to recognize how this place actually works on its own terms. So most of the time, what I see are things from the outside, right, where we are, we don't have an identity that we're that comfortable with, and so we're constantly looking for outside forces. I'll give you an example in planning that doesn't solve the problem, and I won't serve it directly answers your question, but there was a proposal for a square in Midtown that was 563 feet long by something wide, maybe a block, and that's because how that's how long it takes to stop a cattle stampede. Who the hell figured that out is probably dead. <laughs> well that's not a space you can use in Houston. That's a that's a, a, a sort of outside academic and northeastern, I think, in some ways, model being applied to solve our problems here about how we live here and how we interact here and how we're set up here. So I would say that which is why I'm a big fan of what David does, and that is uh, we've got to look closely at what the mechanism at work here is. And the other question is, I'm sorry to tell you, but history will show you this. It's always been about money from Rome uh, to, to Greece uh, or other way around uh, to the beautiful things in London, uh, like the Nash Crescent coming from Oxford Circus was a highly successful real estate deal. And that's all it was. And they didn't care, John Nash didn't care what it looked like. So it's always been about money. There's a certain conflict that you have to move forward with. Okay. Let me ask you two more questions. And Sort of the fast so we can get it open. Do you want me to stop for a second? Uh, the question is what are the institutional challenges in both public and private realms in Houston to, to bringing about useful change in the direction of something sustainable, green, whatever quality like this? What are the challenges we have? We can't have a waterless here in the future. That is to say, waterless urinal. I don't think you should have one anywhere, to be honest with you, but, um, but you can. And so, you know, here we have a client that wants to explore that kind of thing. The good thing is that Sugarland, a lot of the, the smaller cities around Houston have been proactive about getting, uh, you know, it's amazing how many people I meet from cities that are already lead AP or uh, whatever. And again, I'm not endorsing lead. I, there's a lot of issues with it, but there's, there's a lot of proactivity on, on the institutional side, or at least on the governmental side, about learning about what these things are. 
that's the upside. I mean, that's that's what I would say is the number one the number one problem is that as we're innovating over here in the private sector trying to do this stuff, you get to some place, and, and as you get more rural, I promise you, it's it gets bizarre. Uh, you know, doing something in Beeville, which I won't mention. When I mean, they're, they're just like, are you kidding? Me? You know, and, and it's just that's the best the hard part. I agree totally with uh, the, the proactivity statement. For a while, I was uh, involved in the national uh, city planning organization, and so I, I made a point of, of uh, I just assumed that people from Portland and, and Boston were smarter than, than we were. And, and with the uh, actually, I came away uh, with a very different take, that we've got some really smart planners here, and uh, I think we've got some, some very smart, uh, and in, in many cases, visionary elected officials. The big difference in interacting with those folks, though, is uh, the, the engagement, the public engagement. And, and talking with, with people from Seattle, for instance, they said, well, you know, you, you can't get elected to citywide office in Seattle without kind of going through, you know, these, these public organizations. And, and they demand things that, that we don't demand of our elected officials. Mm -hmm. Elected officials are, are like engineers uh, in a way. They, they solve it would have been something, but not that. All right. <laughs> you know, I knew this was going to be an engineer's <laughs> world. Um, I have a tendency to agree with both speakers. Uh, the issue has to be that the general public has to get involved. And you have to demand more of your decision makers. Okay? The problem I have is, as a citizen is I think that those people who make decisions think we're idiots. And, and they don't they don't take us they take us for granted too many times so if you get involved they'll listen and and that's what's happening in the surrounding communities of Sugar Land, Missouri City all these smaller cities they what Jeff said earlier they have identified what they want to be and their, administ their administrations from one administration to the next has carried that same thing maybe one of the problems we have here in Houston is we haven't been able to identify what we want to be and every time we have a new administration, that what I want to be changes. And so, well, how, how do you, if you get the general public involved, you can continue that same thought process from one administration to the next. So the next question is um, <laughs> got a question down there. Well, the next question is section. One word. Sure. It's all you have. By your own particular discipline, profession, what should change about it in order for us to move? Well, I can tell you from the engineering perspective, uh, our, our kids that are coming out of school now have a different view of what engineering should be. And it, it's, not, it's not pure problem solving. It's more of let's get involved with the community and, and why can't it be something other than just the 22 lane highway. Uh, you're seeing that now from, from the newer kids coming out of school. And I think, I think that's where we should be relying on the the educational institutions to, to start that process. That's where it has to start. Well, I think what I said at the outset, uh, we, we planners, uh, I think, tend to sort of swing like a pendulum. I, I was learning how to design uh, curvilinear subdivisions in grad school, and now we're all about the grid. And uh, I think getting back to more of a holistic view, uh, A, and B, uh, taking a page uh, from architecture profession uh, and, and being open to criticism. Uh, I think sometimes since we're out there in front of the public so often we tend to get a little bit defensive and thin skinned. Uh, I like to have my biggest adversaries uh, in the room. Uh, I want to understand where the weak points are uh, in our ideas. Uh, I, I don't want to sell some, some uh, snake oil. You know, so I, I think just having a, a, that broader view, getting back to our general roots and, and then uh, Taking more of a self-critical view. Uh, you know, for us, for architects, we are in an interesting position because we, it's hard for us to, we, we are on the forefront, I think, in a lot of ways of what's happening in sustainability in Greenland. Part of it's our demographics. This is a, this is a, uh, an older, you know, uh, it takes a lot of experience, let me say it that way, uh, to be a, a highly functioning architect. And so we're into our boomers, who are our leaders in our profession, who have the guilt of the 60s. Uh, and are recovering from that through sustainability and it's caught on with uh, with um, with our young with our 
young generation. So, so that's the upside. I think the thing we need to improve on is, uh, uh, you know, there's a bifurcation in our profession between what happens in school and what you practice. There just is. Mm -hmm. And this is a profession where you don't make a lot of money. This is a cheap suit. It's just good. I just picked a good one off the rack. Um, and so people, it's hard to split your time to practice and teach. And that's what I'm seeing the problem being, is that the institutions, and I've been part of them for a long time, although I do run a 50-person architecture firm in two cities, but I've always gone back to teach. And I'm not giving myself an, an example of this, but it needs to happen more. Because the lessons right now are happening so fast at a compressed scale in practice that the professional teachers can't keep up. It's just not, they're not there. They're not there in the real time in the video game of, of our profession uh, to understand what's happening, on, uh, especially on sustainable issues. We just now, at the University of Houston, where I'm currently an adjunct professor, are kind of getting around and really getting focused on the sustainability thing. We have a professor there who's uh, a tenure track who's really getting into this. Now, that's just now. We haven't really had a true champion of it, per se, and it's 2008. I mean, that, that, that's, you know, uh, kind of funny, right? But if there's something you can monkey around with on the computer, we have this thing called BIM in our profession. Well, we're all, we're all over that, right? <laughs> Nobody in here is here to hear BIM. You're going to hear about green sustainability. So that's, I think, what we can do better is, is get, uh, solve the problem we have in the way we educate ourselves. It's, it's, a, it's a bizarre deal. If you imagine a dog getting educated and never, ever, ever seeing the inside of the human body, and then you graduate, you're a doctor, show up on your first day for surgery and they hand you a knife and go, so what do you do with this hand you man? <laughs> that's what we do. Okay, just before I, before I open up to you guys, I want to just make a announcement and that is you know, there's some of these flyers around. Blueprint Houston is going to have an event on Saturday that will be, you may know that the city of Houston has posted a general plan on, on the website. And so this will be a community meeting to talk about that and to hear from uh, Marlon Gaffrey, the planning department, and Carol Lewis, the planning commission, about what that means and what they expect to see happen and how we're ultimately going to get some goals for it. Right now, there, there are no principles involved there. So it's open to everybody and, and just pick up, and I, I don't have the thing, so I can't. I have a question, David. Um, the last time, you know, thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm talking to the architect and the engineer to this planning uh, forum. The last time I, I was at one of these forums, it was at the AIA, AIA at the museum, and that was an architectural forum. And that one pretty much went along the lines of values. You know, they were pretty much lambasting the engineer and the planner for being too scientific and suggesting that we actually need to infuse more values on that one. In, in any event, I have a, a, a question from a planning perspective, and primarily to the engineer and the architect, and of course I have another one for Jeff as well, who, who as we all know, do, does a lot of great work here in the, in the region. The question stems from the definition of sustainability. We're talking about primarily the original definition. This is such that the, uh, development, we're talking about development which meets the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And so the question, you know, from a planner's perspective, when we think about an architect, and what we need to do in the Houston region to bring us towards sustainability in concert with a planner and an engineer. My question is, 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 uh, is there anything about design? I mean, what are we talking about with design that should meet this generation and, and also our future generation's needs? Is there any such thing as timeless design? I think the new urbanists kind of went into the idea that it was this traditional architecture which they identified as timeless. And that's why they consider that to be the sustainability end all be all. So my question to you is, is there such a thing as timeless design? And if the new urbanism uh, group has it wrong, what would you identify it as? And let me just move on to the other questions and then I can go ahead and sit down and have you guys answer. But the question for, for Jeff would be, in thinking about planning for the region, one of the big issues in this region is the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the fight, let's call it that. For, just to be simple here, between the urban development and suburban development. And so basically, in terms of meeting the future generation's needs, what are we talking about with that split in terms of a of, of perspective on whether the suburbs get, or should we continue building in the suburbs, or should we start in the, in the urbs, or when do we do that? You know, help me with understanding where we stand in terms of framing that argument properly, or at least working towards the argument. And I know you're doing a lot of good work with connecting the, uh, the uh, large uh, business districts in this region. And to the engineer, 
specifically to this region and the climate here, what are we talking about in terms of, yes, the bottom line has to be met, but in terms of, of framework for building structures and setting up our infrastructure that will last. You know, we're talking about do it right the first time rather than constantly laying highway and that kind of stuff. You know, what are we talking about from your perspective that needs to be done so, so that we can have timeless infrastructure? And, and that's the question. Uh, there's no such thing as timeless infrastructure. Okay. I mean, we can't do it. Uh, the only way you can, for instance, on a highway project like I-10, uh, the only way you could make it timeless would be to take a global view of the entire region and say, okay, we're going to have this many people this time in the future, so we'll buy all that land today. It's all a matter of dollars. Uh, what you can do, though, is you can predict in the future, uh, some part of that. It, it has to be done in increments. It, it's not a timeless feature at all. It, it, and it's one, it has to be maintained. It, it's all about the maintenance point of the Now, uh, relative to, you know, if you look at I-10, and I-10 is a classic example of a problem we have here, which is what I would think would be lack of planning. Uh, and there's got to be ways of, of putting out a, a thoroughfare system within this area that can accommodate more traffic. And the problem is, is that we didn't have it. And that's why they went to widening I-10. The other areas, you could have widened uh, the, the tow road on, on the West Park tow road area as an alternative to widening I-10. So there are other alternates available to you in terms of infrastructure. But it, there's no such thing as a timeless infrastructure. It just doesn't exist. City versus suburbs, uh, I don't really think that's, that's quite the right debate. No, I'll just give you two uh, examples of that. Um, I think I read that average house tenure in Houston is something like seven years. Uh, I think there are a lot of people who enjoy living in the city uh, in their 20s and again in their 50s and maybe in between uh, favor another sort of lifestyle. So I think we've, we've got to uh, recognize that urban regions are, are interconnected places where we may live a number of different uh, uh, lifestyles uh, if, if we're even in the same area. Uh, right now what I think that the, the battle is, if you will, is that uh, we've got a good system for delivering you know, major roadway infrastructure to uh, support a trend that's been going on for about the last 50 years. Uh, now the last 10 years or so we've seen kind of a re reversal of that trend. I don't know if we've quite thought through what the right kind of investments and policies are, uh, as Stephen was saying, to, to uh, capitalize on, on the many benefits, I think, of, of this trend towards infill. Second, uh, from just a mobility perspective, and you mentioned our, our local centers program, uh, we've done some analysis, and again, being in an organization of 150 member governments, uh, there, there's got to be something in it for everybody. It, it doesn't particularly matter if we have 250 you know, compact neighborhood centers scattered throughout the suburbs or we put everybody inside the loop, there's, there's going to be travel benefits uh, to either of those solutions. And what we're trying to offer is a menu that you know, if, if you have more connected, dense places, uh, that's going to make transit easier, it's going to make walking easier, it's going to consolidate uh, the amount of land that has to be covered in a parking lot, basically. So, whether that's in Sugarland, the Woodlands, or inside the loop, or some combination thereof, that's all good. Uh, timeless design, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I will not take debate on new urbanism or old urbanism because that's a bigger discussion. But uh, timeless design is complicated. Uh, I think if you approach it aesthetically, it's a form of resistance, right? I have to come up with uh, an architecture that's somehow general without being neutral and uh, that 50 years from now it's going to obtain to uh, or intersect with some value system that people hold uh, that they may not hold now. Uh, so that's one strategy and it's a tough one, man. It's tough. Uh, the most sustainable based on that definition of building in Houston is probably the Galleria because uh, it's really quite old uh, for a Houston building uh, when you think about it. Uh, and we, we have a very disposable uh, attitude towards our architecture here. And then it can be refreshed. It's also like cars and like housing on a seven-year refresh cycle. You just—it's uh, a pretty strong infrastructure building. You just retool it on the inside for 
the now 2008 experience or whatever you do when you're shopping. I don't know what people are doing when they're shopping, but it seems to be the last public form of, uh, of behavior that we have in common. Uh, but I would also tell you that there's a giving in strategy, and that is that, uh, that timeless design is, is uh, almost maybe in some ways pointless. Maybe we ought to have a strategy that says, look, we're in a, we're in a disposable society. Uh, instead of trying to make 30 and 50 year buildings, why don't we use a strategy that actually comports with where we are and make a building that when you're done with it, we can recycle, and recover, and put back into place in a different way that appeals to 2022 when all my millennials are adults and they want to see their buildings have interactive video skins on them and they just want to put their hand up there uh, and you know and it knows where they are because that's where we're headed in a lot of ways. So I don't, I don't know about trying to track today a value that may or may not exist in the future. But I think I can have a better sense of creating a building that, that instead of trying to resist its destruction, its demolition, uh, actually understands how it can be taken apart and reused in some other way. That sounds like a BS answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> and that, by the way, is one of the major principles of, of uh, most of the practitioners of new urbanism is the building be able to be anything over time. That's right. So, and I just have to say, the new urban, I get. There's a forum of new urbanists, and they go about 100 messages a day, 150, 100 high-level arguments and so forth. Almost never read about architecture. It's always about the how the public realm works. And it's really, you know, Stephanos Polyzoides does not do traditional architecture. It's not So, Robert. Thank you. <laughs> this has been a very thought-provoking event. But as a planning consultant who sometimes loses work to architects and engineers, I still would like to, the answer to the question of who gets the 8 a.m. phone call and why. Is there anything, I want all of you to answer this, that you think that planners can do better than architects and engineers can do? I don't rank it that way. We, our, our, best, our most success is successful projects that are urban scale currently are overseas and they are done in collaboration with the planner. I think that I think aesthetically. I see the city as a compositional problem, not as an economic problem. I do understand it as an economic problem. But I look at it as a, as a compositional problem. My planning counterpart on those projects, it doesn't. They see it as a problem of other, other issues. Uh, and they're certainly interested in, you know, studying what the trends in retail and office might be and how do we allocate and so on and so forth. And so there's a really good collaboration there. So. I don't really like to knock uh, a planner out of a job ever. Uh, I think it's it's just well, a no, all do. Goes, except a bad planner. <laughs> 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 Who do you think should lead? Let me pray, rephrase it then. Are, are there any situations in which a planner would be better off than the lead? I've been on a lot of interdisciplinary teams, and I love that way of working. But if an architect does a plan, an engineer does a plan, and a planner does a plan in the lead. It's going to be a very different plan if I'm leading I know, but this, look, from the plan so when an architect's leading or an engineer is leading. Uh, what, what gets me about it, uh, that kind of thing is that it's not subsidized self-expression, right? It's not me doing my art with your money. There's a client. And I think uh, the lead would really come from what is appropriate for the situation uh, that the client puts forth. I mean, that's the funny thing about this stuff is, is uh, if I had enough money to do it, it would be perfect. But, I, but there's somebody else over there. And so sometimes it makes sense for the planner to lead based on what the goals of the client are. And that's the funny game that we get into is all of this stuff has to get shaped into how you reshape the goals of an inadequate client sometimes. I know sure. I'm not calling clients inadequate, but sometimes they will not see the fullness of the potential of the problem that they have. And if you come in and you say, look, you know, here's how it has to be, dude. I read this on page 52 of the New Urbanism Manual or whatever. Well, that's not so good. But if over time you say, look, you can get all those things out of it that you want, and, and we can also produce this thing that, if you look at the larger picture, is going to be better. Sometimes the planner is better at that. Sometimes the architect is, and sometimes the urban designer is. So I don't, I don't know if there's a who should lead. I think it's situational. I, I hate to be vague. Well, like, what would be the situation in which you think a planner would best lead? I'm not a planner, so I don't know. I <laughs> Let's move on to Jeff Table. <laughs> 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 There's not many firms in town, engineering-wise, that do do planning. Uh, it, it's, it's a very unique discipline that uh, requires attention of, of, of our, our grade level. Uh, we, we do interact very closely with the land planners, and, and, uh, but only on the cost feature of the project. We're the 
ones that will say, well, this is what this concept is going to cost. We're the ones that say it for and what the alternative concept is going to cost. But then again, as Jeff said, it boils down to our owner and who's going to make those decisions. Uh, usually on our projects, the, uh, the planner is the first one that's on the team. Or if a client hires me, I tell them who to go get and say, if, if you want to develop this particular track and, and you want to get this type of density, uh, you need to go talk to these, these planners. And I usually give them a, a grocery list of planners to go talk to. Them. And then when that planner gets hired, then he calls me and says, okay, let's talk about the project now. So that's usually how I interface with planners. Okay. We'll look at the time. <laughs> Sorry. You know, uh, th this will probably be an unpopular statement, uh, and, and those of you who've been involved in Texas APA, there's been uh, a lot of discussion in, in our group about things like licensing and, and uh, protection. Mainly it's just been to, to allow planners to do projects, not, not require engineers or architects to do them. Uh, I have no problem with, with us not being had to consult, of course, uh, <laughs> Competing with, with anybody, uh, I agree with what Jeffrey said. If if you know there's another discipline that feel that gave a better proposal to the client, uh, I, I don't know that I can say you know well a planner should have done that. Uh, I've been involved. Uh, I've never been involved like you said in a in an engineering root ad. I've been involved in, in some AIA projects. And you're right there. I think there is there is kind of a different approach. So if you're asking me to give a laundry list, I think you know for a community visioning. Uh, for a traditional, uh, comprehensive, or general plan, which apparently is irrelevant now, but uh, I still <laughs> think in it uh, as an ideal. Uh, and I think in, in a neighborhood revitalization project, uh, I think transportation projects where we're not just looking at traffic generation on the site, but kind of uh, interaction of systems, uh, you know, those, those would be things that our discipline and, and background, uh, I think, has, has prepared us for. Uh, on, on a sliding scale towards urban design and master plan community and that sort of thing, uh, I, I think there's less of a unique province. And, and I wouldn't argue that well, we ought to be in charge of you know, a, a town center urban design plan necessarily. Maybe we should, but I, I can't see that case as clearly in my mind. Mm -hmm. I recently looked at um, a draft study from a, a department at the University of Texas in Austin on sustainability, looking at public policies and ranking policies, the localities that support sustainability. They define sustainability in terms of economics, um, environment, and equity, taking in some social issues such as affordable housing, uh, safety from flooding, et cetera. Um, so my question, and so it's interesting the ranking of cities uh, and localities that they that they found. So my question to each of you, and maybe to David also, is what do you think is the most needed public policy from our city, from our county, uh, that would help us move to a broader public and private support of sustainability? Well, I think definitions. Uh, our key and, and the definition that Lester read is, is a pretty good place to start, but uh, you know you, you do what you measure. So uh, I need a few more metrics in that. You know, a thing I read that was was very interesting to me was that uh, by, by a measure of energy consumption, Manhattan is, is the greenest city in the United States, and, and the, the homesteaders in rural Vermont consume 80 times uh, the amount of energy in that lifestyle. Same with, with the lead debate, and I'm glad you brought it up, you know. Uh, tearing down a pretty good old building that's not lead to put up a new lead building, uh, it takes 30 years to recover the, the embodied energy in, in that prior construction. So let's, we've really got to be specific about what we know. I think there are metrics such as vehicle miles traveled, uh, maybe energy, that we've got to look at full cost accounting of those things. So uh, until we really understand what what those measures are, well, when you give us that, that list of measures, then I think we can say, okay, well, these would be the policies and these would be the trade offs Well, I, I think also, I don't think, I don't think you can set policy until you set a vision. And, and until a municipality identifies what their vision is for the future, then you can start setting policy. I, I think after you set the policy, you have to have incentivization. Because let me tell you something, you, 
go to an AIA conference anywhere on planet Earth, and I can see Brian Malarkey sitting out there. Uh, here's what everybody will tell you. God, you guys are so lucky you're in Houston. You can do so much more with green architecture here. We are one of the most green architecture capitals out there. We do more than almost anybody else. I know you're it's only making a face, but trust me. Get it all across my accurate and statement. Uh, but, uh, but I think you, the reason we have it here is because we're a developer-driven community, and you cannot get capital well, up until, I would say, you know, this post-economic meltdown. The capital sources out there, like Prudential and USA and the big lenders, will tell a developer, and I know this because I work for some of them, unless it's lead silver when I'm owning the money, because they look at the future saleability of the building, and, and that's where it's coming from. And now, maybe that's going to change based on economics. So I think you have to have incentivization for the private market to move where we need them to move. Because they, I, you know, you can talk about values and timelessness and all these other kinds of things, but uh, extraction of value from 43,560, which is the square feet an acre, is the game here. And if you can subsidize the added cost to make something better for all of us, uh, from my tax dollars, I'm, well, I don't get my politics away, but I'm okay with it. You know, if my daughter can really breathe some clean air because we're going to do the building right, how much do I pay out my dollar of tax? And I'm okay with that. So incentivization, I think, is a, would be a good policy. And that's a, and that's a scale going down in the hierarchy from vision to implementation and so forth. And you're kind of in more of how, how do we do this thing, which we haven't yet stated. What is it we're trying to do? So I, I, I agree with Stephen that the, the, the absolute biggest need here is in many places is to be able to find a way to get some kind of vision out there that generally speaking we all agree with and, and that is not to say that everything has to be the same a 600 square foot a square mile city is going to have hundreds and hundreds of neighborhoods the localism of that design and that characteristic of that area is going to be different from all others and that's appropriate and that's what we should do but but some guiding principles uh, and so if we look around our region and we see, well, houston Galveston Area Council in several realms is actually moving very much in that direction. It talks about sustainability, has a transportation plan, for instance, long-term one, that has wonderful goals and vision in it about quality of life and so forth. Um, City of Houston is getting really fired up about sustainability. We have a mayor who talks about a lot of issues there, although not, not the development one aspect of it. And then we have this big Harris County, which is, you know, has added more jobs last year than any other county in America, and is one of the fastest growing big urban counties, and doesn't have any sense of vision or public input or sustainability. So that's a pretty big problem. You know, most of the people in our region live in Harris County. And how are we going to move Harris County forward to begin to have policies that reflect what people actually want? Uh, strikes me as the biggest problem on our country. Start holding elections. They have elections. Yeah, they do. Actually, <laughs> next week. Next, next, no, 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 no. Yes. So we need to stop there. Thank you all very much. Thanks to each of you for coming. Let me present you. Touch.